Hello, my name is Les Brown. This is Mamie Brown's Baby Boy, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. You know, at this particular time, I want you to, first of all, pat yourself on the back and take the time to thank yourself for becoming involved in a process for looking at your life. If there's ever time that we need to begin to stop and think and assess ourselves, that time is now. When you begin to look at the foreclosure rate that's going on in the country and the foreclosures and the bankruptcies and in addition to that the violence and people losing their jobs and the level of uncertainty and fear that people are feeling and I think there's a level of stress in the air unlike anything we've ever felt before and so just to take the time to think to pause and particularly not only looking at what's going on but asking yourself the question how's this affecting me you know, we want to all become successful, but I've found that there's some success that's toxic success. What I mean is that you don't want to win, end up going after goals and dreams and neglect yourself. I want you to think about your goals and dreams and things that you want to achieve. And at the top of the list, I want you to put up there your strategy for being here. I just came from the doctor. Let me share something with you. I don't care what goals and dreams that you have. You've got to have your health in order to be here. So at the top of my list, and I'm suggesting you put it at the top of your list, your strategy, your game plan for being here. What are you going to do to take better care of yourself? That's one of the first things I want to ask you about. Because when I look at my life at 64, and I used to think people in their 50s were old, but now that I'm 64, I said, look here, people in their 80s and 90s, they're old people. My goal is to be here not only just to see my grandchildren, but to see my great-grandchildren and my great-great-great-grandchildren. But in order to be here, that's not just lip service. That's a commitment with my time, with my energy, and the choices that I make. So I want you to think about your strategy for being here, and I want you to think about your goal, your goal for securing your life in your future. See, as I get older, my goal right now is to become an asset to my children rather than a liability, financially and physically. See, I don't want to be a burden to my children. I, I don't even know if they like me that well. <laughs> I love my mother. My goal and dream was to take care of my mother. I did that. I bought her a home. I took care of her until she's 89. But children, they're different today. These are different type of people up in here. You don't know what this generation might do. Now, I know they say, Dad, we love you, but I really, really want to stay in good shape and take care of myself because I don't want to be around the house and, and my kids say, look here, who's going to take care of him today? All he's doing is sit around talking to himself, talking about, yes, I can, and yes, I will, talk it out of his head. No, I don't want that kind of party for me. My goal and objective is to die young at an old age. So I have a game plan. I, I don't like to eat vegetables all the time, but now I feel like a silly wabbit. <laughs> Why? Because I realize at this stage of my life, I've got to eat more vegetables. I've got to get more rest. I've got to drink more juices. And I've got to do all of the things that make the healthy choices that will say to my body, Les, you plan to be here. I see that you're serious, so I'm going to take care of you. I do 160 push-ups every morning nonstop. Why? I couldn't do that at 15 or 20. But at this stage of my life, I've got to do those kinds of things in order to challenge my body, to stretch my body, and to indicate I plan to be here. What's your plan? What's your goal? Because if you don't have a goal for being here, being here is not a given. When I was a kid, we used to go to funerals of old people. I can't tell you how many young people whose funerals I've gone to. I can't tell you how many. And so, and, and there's something about between 40 and 60. I don't know what it is about that period in time. Between 40 and 60, when you, if you're approaching 40, I can tell you, and you already know, life begins to intensify. Things happen to you, and things happen to people you care about. Between 40 and 60, if you can make it through that period, whew, you can take a deep breath, because most people don't make 60. Most people don't. And why? And I think it's because people just take it for granted that they're going to be here. So I want to share with you some goals and strategies that you think about your goals. I want you to visualize yourself having optimal health, um, having your right mind. I used to ask my mama, Mama, every Sunday you stand up in church and other older members of the church say, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. Why do you all say that all the time? She said, don't worry, son. You live long enough, you'll find out she was absolutely right. I went in the room the other day to find something. I got in there, and I couldn't remember what I was looking for. 
I came out. I remembered what I was looking for. I went back in. I found it. Then I couldn't remember why I was looking for it. One of our children said, Daddy, you need some ginkgo biloba. I said, what's that? She said, something for your memory. I went down to the health food store. I was walking around. The lady said, may I help you, sir? I said, I forgot why I'm here. <laughs> she said, you need something for your memory. I said, I know. So they took me over to a little section, and I bought the stuff, and then I took it home. Now, I can't remember where I put it. So when I got up this morning, I said, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. See, if you woke up in your right mind this morning, that's a good thing. I called a friend of mine the other day, Miss Williams. said, Miss Williams, how you doing? She said, baby, I'm doing good. She said, I went to the bathroom by myself, not all myself. I said, too much information, too much information. Let me tell you something. But that's a good thing. I know about that. I've been in the hospital. I know what it is not to be able to move. I know what it is to have back challenges. I know what it is to be in pain. So this thing called life, you've got your health? Let me share something with you. That's a good thing. A friend of mine, Bishop T.D. Jake, said, if you got a problem man or money can solve, you ain't got no problem. I can agree with that. And I learned some things going through that experience. And really, I should say, growing through that experience. My goal at that time was to be here. And trust me, it's better be seen than to be viewed. Are you feeling the brother? Up in here, up in here. So I want you to think about your goals and dreams. And here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to say to yourself, it's possible. It's possible. And I want you to follow along with this process. As you think about your goals and dreams, I want you to write this down. I'm going to give you some strategies of maintaining this possibility mindset. I want you to write down mindset maintenance. Mindset maintenance. Let me share something with you. The easiest thing that I do every year is to live my dream. That is helping people to realize their potential, to step into their greatness, challenging themselves, reinventing themselves, to start their own businesses. I've helped over 400 people earn millions of dollars. The easiest thing I do every year is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, going into prisons and juvenile detention centers, teaching young people mindset development, how to become effective communicators, how to dress like a prospect rather than a suspect. Those are the easy things that I do. Let me share with you the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life. And that was to believe that I could do it. That's the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my entire life. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida, with a twin brother, we were adopted, we were six weeks of age by Mrs. Mamie Brown, and I called myself Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said, God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was labeled educable mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, fell again when I was in the eighth grade, to believe that I had the ability to live the life that I'm now living. No one could have told anybody who knew me, including myself, looking in on us when Mrs. Mamie Brown was raising us in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City in Overtown, that I would be who I am right now. I didn't even know that. And I want you to think about your goals and dreams, and I want you to expand them. Why? Because it has been said that most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss. No, most people fail in life because they're just like I was for 14 years. They aim too low and hit. And many never aim at all, not at all. They just go through life surviving. Someone said that many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65. I was talking to a friend of mine named Rosia, and I said, Rosia, how are you doing? And she said, let me tell you something. Life is a mess. I said, girl, what are you talking about? She said, my life is a mess. She said, you know what? She said, I just was sitting up here thinking, I haven't lived. I haven't lived. She said, I've been working hard all my life, paying bills and taking care of my children, and my children are gone, and I've just been thinking, I haven't done anything. She said, when I die, I don't want when people view my body, I don't want them to say, oh, she had a funny expression on her face. <laughs> I said, what do you mean by that? I don't want to have an expression that I'm mad, because if I died right now, I would be mad. I said, why? What are some of the things you'd like to do? She said, travel. I would love to travel. I'd like to see the pyramids. I've never been to Paris. I want to go to Paris. I've never been there. There are things that I want to see, things I want to do. She said, I want to make a difference in young girls' lives, teenage mothers. I was a teenage mother. I want to be able to make a difference in their lives and see the impact that I had on their lives. And she learned, she, she mentioned a variety of things. And I, I remember 
a story about a lady who went to the doctor and she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she came home and she was sitting at a table and, and she was drinking some coffee and all of a sudden she, she just looked up and, and she said, I refuse to die an unlived life. I refuse to die an unlived life. And she decided that she was going to live. That up to that point, her life was for her family, for her children, for her husband. But she, she had left herself out of the equation. Have you ever done that? I, I remember at a period in my life, I was going to work and I was working on a job that I hated. And at the same time, I was praying that I wouldn't get fired. I was praying that I wasn't laid off. I was miserable. Nobody was holding a gun to my head. But I showed up every day, and I used a flimsy excuse. Well, I've got to pay the bills. I've got a car payment I have to pay. I have a family. I have children. I have a, a car note, and I have a mortgage note I have to pay. I've got to survive. I was showing up for a paycheck. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not living. And a friend of mine said, you know when people change? And I said, no. He said, when they get to the point when they say, I've had it. I've had it. I think the only reason that you're listening to me right now, the only reason that you're watching this webinar, that there's somewhere in your heart of hearts that you've said, as you looked at your life, you said, I've had it. And not only have you said, I've had it, but you said also in your heart of hearts, I can do better than this. And let me share something with you. You can. Because if anybody told me, and I'm, not, I'm going to share some things with you that I've done, not for the purpose to impress you, but to impress upon you what the possibilities are when you work on your mind and have mindset development. Because I've found that how people live their lives is a result of their state of mind. It has been said, you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. So part of the process, number one, is expose yourself to positive messages. See, what I'm doing right now, I'm distracting the story that's going on in your head right now. How you live your life, how I live my life, how all of us live our lives is a result of the story we believe about ourselves. And most of us are born into stories. I was born into a story where we were poor, but we didn't know it. I didn't know we were poor until I got on a bus with my mother going to do domestic work on Miami Beach. And when we crossed the Venetian Causeway and I saw those big, beautiful hotels, and I was in the homes with my mother making up beds and cleaning and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. And we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. And I kept saying, Mama, what is it, boy? As we got ready to pack up to go back home and to Overtown and Liberty City and all the poverty and filth and the violence there, I said, why can't we stay here? Why can't we stay here? She said, Leslie, we can't. Why? Because we can't. Why, Mama? Why can't we? She said, it's just the way it is. Now shut up. And... I kept saying to myself, why is that the way that it is? And I guess I was okay for Wesley and Margaret Ann and Leonard and Angelo and Sharon and Linda, but it wasn't okay for me. I was curious. I wanted to live like Mr. Sidersky lived. I wanted the big car that he had. I wanted that big home that he had. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment. It was seven of us plus Mama. He had a big mansion, just three of them, 10,000 square feet. I said, Mama, what is it, Leslie? One day, I want to buy you something just like this. My brothers and sisters, when we were on the bus going back, they were just engaged in playful things. I was thinking and dreaming. Mama didn't understand why I was thinking like that, because I'd been exposed to positive messages. I had to take care of Mr. Sidersky. I had to shine his shoes and clean his office. And every day when he was listening to motivational messages, I was hearing those things too. Earl Nightingale, we become what we think about. All of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. In order to be successful, you must be willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. Your mind is a machine. You must program yourself for success. Wow. When I heard those words, I said, wait a minute. I can program my mind for success? I can program my mind for wealth? You can too. Trust me. I've earned over $55 million in the last 28 years. Anybody told me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now? I spoke recently in Sweden. They paid me 40,000 euro for an hour speech. I had no idea that this Les Brown that you now see had the ability to do that. I used to work for the Miami Sanitation Department as a garbage collector. I used to be a janitor. I used to do door-to-door -door sales. I used to work for Sears in Miami on Biscayne Boulevard. 
I had no idea this Les Brown that you now see had the ability one day to give lectures at Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth University. I had no idea that this Les Brown existed. I don't tell you that to impress you, but to impress upon you. There is more in you. Simba, there's more in you than you have been expressing. All of us have seen Lion King, some great symbols in there. And I say to you, there's more in you right now that's represented in your bank account. There's more in you right now that's being reflected by your life right now. Your life is not a true reflection of your potential. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. There's a reason that my favorite book says, as a man think it, so is he. And as he continues to think, so he remains. In order for us to begin to break into that level of greatness that we have within ourselves, you have to make a conscious choice every day to expose your mind to positive messages. So I put myself on a regimen. I do this every day, and I suggest that you do it. Write this down. Number one, listen to motivational messages every day. If you have Choosing Your Future, a set of tapes, a CDs that we produce, or Creating Your Greatest Life, I guarantee you, if you do what I'm sharing with you right now, for six straight months, every day your life will never be the same again. I guarantee it 100%. You listen every day for one hour to Creating Your Greatest Life, any of those messages, because faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. What it will begin to do is interrupt the story in your mind. It will override the story that you believe about yourself. It will distract all the negative thoughts that you have that's holding you back, that held me back for 14 years. When I used to go see the number one motivational speaker on the planet, Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins, and, and my heart said, I can do that. I love to help people. I'm just like my mother. And then my mind would ask how. And I went from my heart to my mind. And my mind would say, Les Brown, you don't have a college education. Les Brown, you've never worked for a major corporation. Les Brown, you were labeled educable mentally retarded. They call you DT, the dumb twin. You're not as smart as your brother. Have you ever thought about something you wanted to do and you convinced yourself that you couldn't do it? See, sometimes we need to have some external voices. And so by listening to motivational messages, that began to override the negative thoughts that I had about myself in my mind. And it gave me a new story and empowered me and gave me a vision of myself beyond my circumstances and mental conditioning and started me to writing a new chapter in my life. And so now, money will never be another issue for me. And that was an issue for most of my life because I did know what I did know and I thought I knew. So one you have to do is that you have to have a mindset development strategy where you are deliberately taking an hour every day listening to a motivational message. Every day, here's something else. Read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. Why? And read it with conviction and, and stay focused. 10 to 15 pages every day. This is seven days a week? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every day, McDonald's know that you know where they are. Burger King know that you know where they are. But every day they have some advertising. They have billboards. They have radio. They have television. Why? Because by exposing you to those messages, that will begin to impact your behavior. And it will drive you into the place to purchase what they're advertising. Now you're advertising for your greatness. And faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So you want to listen to positive messages every day. You do this, I'm telling you. Your life will never be the same again. And read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. I read two to three books a week. Why? Because I have goals and dreams of things I want to achieve. I want my life to count. I want to make a greater impact. At this stage of my life, I'm working on my children's 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 education. A good man leaves a legacy for his children's children. So I'm working on their education at this point in my life. And as I begin to look at myself in order to achieve more and to do more, I know I have to work more on my mind. And let me give you an example of how this works. The most money I've ever earned in an hour and a half, $260,000. That's the most money I've ever earned in an hour and a half. A lot of people work a whole month and don't do that, or six months. Then, and this is the next thing I want you to do. I want you to look at your relationships, and I want you to upgrade your relationships. See, MIT did a study, and this study indicated that you earn within two to $3,000 of your closest friends. Not only did I start reading books every day and listening to positive messages, but I separated myself from my friends who did not have goals and who did not have dreams. Why? Because people rub off on you. It's called a mind virus. 
you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends so when you upgrade your relationships you got to ask yourself the question who is it that i need to associate with that i can learn from that i can grow mentally emotionally spiritually and financially by aligning myself with another person that i can learn from and dr dennis kimbrough said if you're the smartest one in your group you need to get a new group whoa think about that i was the smartest one in my group then one person called me who had been admiring me for years and said, Les, I, I want you to coach me and my trainers on how to tell a story and create value for an audience. And I want to share with you some things. I want to teach you some things, old man. I said, is that right? He said, yes. You always say you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. I want to teach you some things. I said, okay, I'm open to that. Now, let me share this with you. He blew my mind. The most money, as I mentioned to you, I've ever earned speaking to over 8,000 people in Salt Lake City, Utah, $260,000. I did an event with this individual, just over 500 people, because of what I learned from him, because I upgraded my relationships, I earned over $410,000 in an hour and a half. I was excited, but I was also depressed, because I've been speaking for 28 years. And I start thinking about all the money that I left on the table, all the hotels and plane rides, all of the audiences I spoke to, all of the money that I missed out on because I didn't know that I didn't know and I thought I knew. I was a big fish in a small pond. I can't tell you, if you don't get anything else, you have to look at your relationships and you've got to ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? And I mean in every area of your life. When the doctor looked at me and said, you have cancer, cancer is the most feared word in seven different languages. One of the first things I had to do, I found out who had cancer at some point in time or was living with cancer and conquered it. I surrounded myself with people who had done what I wanted to do, who were winning at the game. See, it's, it's very important, every area of your life, if you want to improve your health, start hanging around healthy people. They did a 30-year a, a study and said that the reason that most people are obese, it's a mind virus. Listen to what they said. A mind virus is communicated mind to mind. That if you have a friend that's fat or you marry somebody that's obese, you have a 41% to up to 161% of becoming obese yourself. Even if they live in another state. Whoa, why? Because birds of a feather flock together. Never forget a high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, said, Mr. Brown, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll become number 10. Whoa. Think about that. Part of your mindset development, not only listening, not only reading, but you have got to look at your relationships Upgrade your relationships and continue to evaluate them and make sure they're an asset to you and not a liability. My son, John Leslie, is a motivational speaker. He has a saying, who should you count on and who should you count out? See, there's some relationships that can start out real positive, and then sometimes we outgrow people. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever outgrown someone, somebody you used to be close to, used to be your bosom buddy, and then you haven't been together for a time, and then when you get together, you have absolutely nothing in common. Sometimes that happened with family members. My twin brother, it's a strained conversation because he's talking about, Les, did you hear who died? No, I don't get up reading the obituary column. I'm glad my name is not there. Hello, I don't care. I'm focusing on living. Our conversations are so different. Isn't it interesting how you could be raised in the same family, same circumstances, by the same parents and end up dramatically different? It's called life. Here's the other thing that's very important. Write down the goals that you want to achieve. Write them down. Put them on a, ten, uh, on a three by five card. And, and, and I want you to use a King James Version Bible and, and Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. I want you to write that on one side of the card. On the flip side of the card, I want you to write down one major goal that you want to achieve. And you want to read that 
three times a day, three times a day. What are you doing? You're hypnotizing yourself and you're dehypnotizing yourself. What you're doing is you are dispelling the myths and all of the spells that you're living under. I think that a poverty mindset is a spell. I think that people go so far and because they're mesmerized by life, they unconsciously stop. And you have to break that spell by constant attention. So on one side you read your goal, that one major goal, three times a day. Then the flip side, you flip that scripture over. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be given unto you. As you read that every day, every day, three times a day, I can tell you, amazing things, breakthroughs will happen for you. Now, we're going to take a break right now, and I want you to take the time to think about this one thing. What is it that you're going to do differently? Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. You've got to be willing to give up who you've been to give birth to who you can become. I want you to take the time and write down one radical change that you're going to make about you, and you know if you do that, your life will never be the same again. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Les Brown. We're going to take a break right now, and we'll be right back. Hello, this is Les Brown, Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I hope you took some time to really go within because, see, no one knows you like you. You know what it is that you need to work on. I mean, one of my main issues that I had to dramatically change about myself was I had to develop courage. I used to go see people do things. I saw speakers on stage. My heart would say, I can do that. But I didn't have the courage to stand up for myself. For 14 years, I procrastinated. For 14 years, I kept myself as a spectator sitting on the sidelines. And then I saw a speaker, and he was so boring, the room was as quiet as a graveyard between funerals. And I said, whoa, if he can do it, I know I can do it. And because... I saw what he did, and his brother-in-law was sitting next to me, and he said, you ought to be that boring and earn the kind of money he earned. I said, how much do they pay him? He said, $5,000. I said, $5,000? He's only been talking for about 45 minutes or an hour. He says, that's how much they make. Now, I wasn't earning $5,000 a month. I said, wait a minute. If he can do that, I know I can do that. Have you ever done that before? He gave me courage. And so at that, at that moment, now that was a decision. I didn't have to have his example of, of somebody that, that was less talented than I was to give me the courage. I should have had the courage to stand up myself, to believe in my own stuff. But the truth of the matter is, I didn't. And I can't unscramble those eggs. I cannot pull those years back. I cannot recapture those 14 years. Maybe... That's why my, my favorite book says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, and press toward the call of your higher calling. Press toward that mark of your higher calling. And that's what I do. That's what I do every day. I have to continue to work up the courage. I remember going in to do a presentation before a group of educators. I was the only one there without a college degree. And I had to talk to myself. I went into the bathroom and I said, Les Brown, let me tell you something. What do you care about the fact they have MBAs and PhDs? That only means pile high and deep to you and not any dis disrespect for credentials. They're very important. But I had to get myself together. Hey, look here. You can't go in there worrying about what they have. Just bring what you have. You got seven children you got to take care of. You got a mother you have to take care of. And you have something to say. You have some talent. You have some abilities. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to stand up. You can't punk out now. You can't fold now. See, sometimes you have to talk to yourself. It might be the most intelligent conversation you will ever have, talking to yourself. So that radical change, it doesn't happen overnight. You can make the decision, but you've got to stay on top of yourself every day to come from and live your life from a place of power, courage, and faith as opposed to being a volunteer victim, as most people are volunteer victims. Here's something else. Get an accountability partner. Get someone 
that's like you, a like-minded, like-hearted person, that you have similar goals and dreams, and you hold each other accountable, and you talk with each other on a regular basis. And if you can, join a mastermind group of other supportive mindsets of individuals who are working to improve themselves, who are stretching and challenging themselves. And here's something else, a worthwhile investment. Find yourself a coach. Find someone in your industry, find someone in your area of interest that you can invest in yourself and have an accountability coach. I have a coach. I spend over $100,000 a year on my personal growth and development on my coach. Why, Les? You're Les Brown. You were selected one of the top five speakers in the world. You got the highest award from Toastmasters International and the National Speakers Association. You, you're one of the highest paid speakers in the world. Why would you need a coach? If you ever watch Tiger Woods, who everybody would say arguably one of the greatest golfers on the planet today, whenever he swings, you will see him look at the ball, and then he'll look to the right to look at his coach. If Tiger Woods needs a coach, what do you need? What do I need? Here's something I can tell you that I know. You can't see the picture when you're in the frame. You can't see the picture when you're in the frame. Most people fail because they don't know that they don't know and they think they know. Einstein said, the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. See, what got you where you are right now? Your best thinking has produced the level of money that you have, your level of accomplishment, the growth of your business, or the lack of. Your best thinking has produced that. Own that. Face that and get some help. One of the things I teach, ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. And ask for help. And don't stop until you get it. And so take the time and find someone that can coach you. Find someone that will have the courage to tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. And that's what I have. And Mike Williams, who's been my coach for the past 38 years and I shudder to think what would have happened to me. I used to be a disc jockey, Les Brown, the man about town, LB, Triple P. There were none before me. There will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single, love to mingle, certified, bona fide, duplicate, qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. I was bad, baby. Yes, I was. And this guy said, Les, you're more than a disc jockey. What are you talking about? Man, if you can entertain people and don't see them, if you can reach people less through this microphone and you can't see them, what can you do if you could see them? If you can entertain them, you can educate them. You can empower them. If, if you can be less from the man about town and, and you can swim to the bottom of the deepest ocean or climb to the mountain, the top of the highest mountain, no matter where you go, they'll be talking about me, LB, Triple P. If you can come up with all of that kind of gobbly gob garbage, what could you do if you sat down and you started thinking and doing editorials about things that's maintaining our detriment? What could you do to inspire people to register to vote? What could you do to begin to impact public policy? You've got to get a larger vision of yourself. I said, Mike, I never thought about myself in that way. See, has everyone, anybody ever seen something for you that you didn't see it for yourself? I didn't see that for myself. Maybe that's why my favorite book says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for you. Because of what he saw in me, he inspired me. He gave me a vision of myself beyond my circumstances, beyond my mental conditioning, and beyond the job where I was, because I thought I was just a disc jockey. I love that. I'm master a microphone. You drop me in any city, I can master a microphone. I can turn a city upside down with a microphone. But... I had more in me than I was expressing, and I did not know it. And because of this encouragement, I became a community activist. Because of this encouragement, I started doing a talk show called Voice of the People. Because of this encouragement, when I got out of radio, I ran for the Ohio legislature, and I was elected. And because of this encouragement, I passed 14 bills my first term. Because of this encouragement, I was elected three times and became the chairman of the Human Resource Committee. Because of this encouragement, I became a public speaker. Because of this encouragement, I became an author. Because of this encouragement, I did a show for King World called The Les Brown Show, and they paid me $5 million, $2 million not to speak. Because of this encouragement, I produced specials for PBS, public television. 
They said, you can't do that. You don't have a college education. It's educational television. Because of his encouragement, I did so many things I had absolutely no idea that I could do. I encourage you to live full and to die empty. There's more in you right now than just working on a job where they pay you just enough to keep you from quitting and you work just hard enough to keep from getting fired. And when you make the decision and identify that key area of your life that you need to make a radical change, things will begin to open up for you. Now here's the other thing that's very important. Once you identify your goal, I want you to get, if possible, a visual picture of your goal. My major goal was to buy my mother a home. I got the picture of the home with a 12-foot swimming pool and a basketball court on a golf course. I bought that home for my mother. It cost just over $400,000, 10,000 square feet. I had a picture long before I had the money and the down payment to get it. My goal was to be known nationally and internationally as a speaker. I had that goal. I had a card that I had on one side, asking it shall be given, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened. On the other side I have, I'm the world's number one orator. I produced that result in my life. I had a goal of becoming a talk show host. I used to watch Phil Donahue, and I put my picture on the screen of the television as I listened to the program. I visualized myself there, and I was called by King World Production, and I had my own talk show. Well, it was the highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. Well, at least I had one. <laughs> it's called life. Now, here's something else. You will fail your way to success. Trust me on that. You can have a lot of failures, a lot of disappointments, but you will fail your way to success. Goethe says that which does not kill you will make you stronger. See, 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. That's why you have to be of good courage. You have to have courage. When life knocks you down, I have a saying, try and land on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up. So once you look at and decide the goal that you want, you want to put some things, put a treasure board or a, a goal board and have pictures of the goal that you want to achieve so you can see it every day. When you get up in the morning and the last thing at night, you're programming your subconscious mind where nine out of ten decisions that you make comes from there. Here's something else. Not only do you want a, a physical picture that you can see every day to remind you to keep you on course, but the other thing that's very important, achieving your goals, writing your goals down in detail, and having seven action steps that you take every day. Now, Robert Shuler said, by the yard it's hard, but inch by inch, anything is a cinch. You want to think about what are the things I need to do every day. Break it down into increments. You have your 30-day goals, and you have your three-month goals, and your six-month goals, and your one-year goals, all right? You want to break it down in increments. What do you need to do starting today? Don't squander any time. There goes a second. There goes another second. There goes another second. And all the power in the world can't bring it back. So what are seven things that you can do starting today? And then once you do those seven things, then you work on all the other stuff. But what are the seven most important steps that you can take that can move you in the direction of your goal? And when I decided to become a speaker, I started memorizing quotes every day. That was one of the goals I had, to memorize quotes. I have probably over four to 500 quotes and statistics in my head in all kind of areas. I've spoken at the National Convention for Real Estate Conventions, REMAX. I've, I've spoken for doctors and lawyers. I trained over 5,000 doctors last year, teaching doctors how to communicate with their patients to increase their taking of their hypertension medication, to increase their compliance from 30 percent. I was paid $640,000 in one month, Monday through, Friday, Monday through Thursday, 30 minutes a day. A lot of people work a whole year and don't do that. I don't tell you that to impress you, but to impress upon you. You've got greatness in you. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. I had no idea this Les Brown you see existed. I had no idea. And the reason that you're watching me now is because you know in your heart of hearts that you can do what I've done and even more. And so as you begin to think about that, think about writing your goals down, listening to motivational messages, changing your relationships, upgrading your relationships, thinking about seven things you need to do every day, some radical change you need to make in you. There's an old African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Here's something else that's very, very important. As we talked about having a personal coach, the next thing that's important 
about reaching your goals is this. What is it as you look in your past that's affecting you right now? I, I saw a movie called Magnolia, a powerful line in that movie. And the movie said, we might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. Whoa. Let me share something with you I realize about myself. The reason that I procrastinated for 14 years was because when I was in the fifth grade and Mrs. Mary Ford Williams said to Mrs. Crompton, he doesn't belong here. He is slow. He's not like his brother. And they put me back from the fifth, fifth grade to the fourth grade. That affected me. I didn't even realize it. They say sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Yes, they will. But they can also free you up. Because I'll never forget when I met Mr. Washington. It was my junior year in high school. I had been in special education from the fourth grade all the way up to my junior year in high school. My twin brother always made the honor roll. And he said, young man, work this problem out for me. He was a new instructor. I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, look at me. Yes, sir. Work the problem out anyhow. I can't do what you asked me to do, sir. Why? Sir, because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded. And the students erupted in laughter. They said, hey, he's DT. He said, what's that? He's the dumb twin. He's not Wesley. That's Leslie. And he came from behind his desk and he said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. I was, I was a jarring statement. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated. Because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is. He only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be. Then it becomes what he should be. And here's what I learned from that experience. I want you to visualize yourself already there. Whatever goal, whatever dream that you have, see the picture complete. See yourself there. Why? We have something at the base of our brains called the reticular activating system. See, you have genius within you. And, and to prove it, let me give you an example. The other night, I, I said... I've got to get up tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. I was at a hotel. I called downstairs and told them to call me at 7 o'clock. The hotel neglected to do it, but I woke up at 7 o'clock on the nose. Have you ever done that before? How did you know when to get up? Hey, that subconscious mind. Everything we need, the answers are already there. Have you ever seen somebody and said, you know what, I, I remember your face, but I, I don't exactly know where. And then later on you say, hey, I know, I know where I saw you, and it came. What happened? The conscious mind sent that thought to the subconscious mind, and it pulled that information up and gave it to you. Now, when you begin to hold the vision of what it is you want to achieve, you stimulate what is called the reticular activating system. It's a network like group of cells at the base of your brain. Let me share with you how it works. Have you ever purchased a car? No one goes to buy a car that has the same color that everyone else has. Has that ever happened to you before? But then once you buy the car and you drive it off the lot, you start seeing it everywhere. Say, hey, where did this come from? Let me, let me tell you what happened. You made an investment. And because you made an investment that piqued your awareness, that stimulated your reticular activating system. Another case in point. I was at a party with a friend of mine, and, and we were dancing, and music was blasting. She said, wait a minute. My son is crying. He's at the door. I said, your son's not at the door because even if he were, you wouldn't be able to hear him. And she stopped, went to the door, opened the door, and there her four-year-old son was at the door. How did she hear it and I didn't hear it and the other people dancing? It wasn't our child. It was her child. Her reticular activating system picked up his whimpering sound. And I'm saying to you that you have that in you. When you focus on your goals and dreams and you visualize it complete, it will stimulate the reticular activating system and it will lead you there following all the other things that we suggested. Now, not only is it possible you can live your dream, it's necessary that you change relationships, that you get a coach, that you meet with other like-minded people that will hold you accountable, that you write your goals down, that you have seven steps that you do every day on your goals to monitor and see where you are, but you've got to take full responsibility. If everything work out for you, fine. If you have the money, fine. If you can get the help and support of friends and family members and your spouse, great. But if you don't, all of those things are minor things. The major key to your reaching your goals is you. Nobody's going to work on your dream harder than you. Trust me on that one. You've got to take responsibility to make it happen. If it happens when you come out the gate, fine. But if you fail, so what? Come back again and again and again and again. If it's something that you love, if it's your passion, until you do it. George Bernard Shaw said,
people that make it in this life. They look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. Here's something else. It's hard. When I bought the first home for my mother, and they did a, and I didn't do a title search, and a guy sued me, and I had to move out from the big, beautiful home I bought her to a roach-infested home I moved her out of. And the neighbors came out and said, maybe y'all back? Yes, what happened? My boy lost the house. He didn't do a title search. And we had to get out. They foreclosed on the house. He didn't have the $50,000 to pay the guy who put a lien on the property. It was devastating. But let me tell you something. It was worth it. Because I came back, 90 days later, I got a bigger and better house. 90 days later, I stayed focused on the goal. And that's the thing that you want to do. Stay focused on your goal. Keep the main thing the main thing. You're going to have distractions. That's a part of the process. It's not there to stop you. It's only there to challenge you. You want to grow through it. You know, I think it was Robert Shul who said, tough times never last, but tough people do. Keep the main thing the main thing. You're going through hell? Don't stop. Keep moving. <laughs> Keep on moving. Don't stop to talk about it. Keep moving. That's the name of the game. Keep on swinging. One of my favorite movies is, is Cool Hand Luke and, 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 and Paul Newman. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but there's a scene where Cool Hand Luke is fighting a guy. Guy, big dude, just kept knocking him down. Bam! That kept on knocking him down. Cool Hand would get up. He'd knock him down. Bam! And pretty soon the guys would feel inside and say, stay down, Cool Hand. Stay down. Cool Hand Luke would get back up again. Guy would knock him down. Bam! The guy would say, stay down, man. Stay down. Cool Hand would get back up again. The guy would knock him down. Bam! And after a while, the guy got tired of knocking Cool Hand down. And Cool Hand stood up. Everybody had walked away, and he was still swinging in the wind. Swinging. Nobody was there but him. That's who I am. Cool Hand Luke. That's who you want to be. Cool hand, look, you keep on swinging and the universe will yield to you. It will dispatch angels to come rescue you and say, back off. Give him what he wants. Give her what she wants. Let's go find a whip today. That's the way life is. It's hard, but it's worth it. What it will make it worth it for you? Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, you can endure almost anyhow. I want you to take the time and write down 12 reasons on why you won't fail. Because when the tough times come, they're going to come. When life hits you on the blind side, and that's going to happen, your children start going crazy. Or someone you thought you'd be married to for the rest of your life, like I went through, and they decide they want a divorce, call life. What is it that can keep you going? Your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to take you through that process. I can tell you it's possible. You can live your dreams. It's necessary that you surround yourself with people you can learn from and grow from, that you write your goals out, you work on them every day, that you have a made of mind, I'm going to make it. It's necessary that you constantly work on yourself, reading positive material, listening to positive material, going to seminars and workshops, investing in yourself, getting a coach, and it's you. You've got to take personal responsibility to make it happen. Don't see yourself as a victim, and it's hard. It's hard. Changing your life is hard. Getting up. Working when you're in pain is hard, it's hard, it's hard. Working when you are trying to make something happen for you and the family and you go home and, and you're facing a living hell where you need to refuel and replenish yourself mentally and emotionally and spiritually and you got a battle in your home base. It's hard to keep your spirit up. It's hard. And people don't see the vision. They don't believe in you. They say, oh, you can count on me, and they're not there. They just lied. They're only there when they need you. It's hard. I can tell you, it's worth it. The sacrifice that you have to make, I can tell you from my experience, it's worth it. So take the time to write down, what are those 12 reasons of why you won't give up? What is it that will make it worth it for you? And once you find that, you will create some momentum in your life, and then it's done. It's done. Stick a fork in it. It's done. Here's something I want you to keep in mind. Life is a fight for territory. It's a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. I want you to read that. I want you to memorize that. I want you to put it someplace where you can see it. I want you to keep that in mind. Life is a fight for territory. 
And once, once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. Once you stop fighting for financial freedom, I am cancer free, I'm debt free, and I'm drama free. I have the faith to call forth those things that be not as though they were. I'm fighting for my peace of mind. I'm fighting for my freedom. I'm fighting for my children's children's children. I'm fighting to create a brighter tomorrow. I'm fighting to make a difference in life. I'm fighting to, to make my print, to leave my mark. I'm, I, I refuse to die an unlive life. And, and that, that's what you are doing right now. You're saying to yourself, I refuse to die an unlive life. I want my life to count. I want my life to mean something. I want not to be a burden to anybody. I want to control my own future, to write my own check, to control my own destiny, to do, want to do, to do what I want to do when I want to do it, not to answer to anyone else but myself. You have it like that. The only reason you're watching me is because we're cut from the same cloth. We're branches of the same tree. The only reason you take the time to invest in your time, your money, and your energy to just stay here and focus right now because you feel me in your heart. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I say to you, keep in mind what I said. Life is a fight for territory. Once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. Jim Rohn said something I love. He said, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. No. Life is too short and unpredictable, as, as Helen Keller would say. Eat the dessert first. Don't let it find you sliding down the same mountain. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what your dreams are. Here's what I know about you. You have greatness within you. Here's what I know about you. And I don't even know you, but based upon my own experience, you were chosen on purpose for a purpose. One out of 400 million sperm. You have greatness within you. But greatness is a choice. It's not your destiny. It's a choice that you have to make every day. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. The mediocre part of yourself or the greatness that you were chosen for. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I hope you've gotten some value out of this. It's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. God bless you. God bless your dream. And God bless the greatness that is in you. The world needs you. And we need you now. And so it is. <laughs>